This podcast represents my opinion and the opinion of my guests. This is not medical advice, and I am not establishing a patient-physician relationship with any listener. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for informational purposes only. And because each patient is so unique, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions you may have. This is Vanessa here with Dr. Tadros again today for another episode of the Not Your Doc podcast. Howdy. Welcome back. We're here today with Dr. Tadros and Seth, um, and we're going to get right into another medical topic today. I feel Mm -hmm. like we've gotten a a good string of them, Dr. Tadros, so really cashing in on your your internist (laughs) Thought process I, I in think your I'm blog. S- I think I'm spent. Whenever we get to, whenever we get to somewhere twenty podcasts, that's all I know, and uh, I will not put I will not stuff my brain with any more. We're gonna have to get some 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 real practitioners. We on, made it on through the- episode seven of the second season, and now you're out of thoughts. <laughs> I, I don't believe it. I, I've run out. I've run out. We're gonna get some real pr- experts uh, on uh, in the near future here. Yeah, looking yeah. forward to that for sure. Um, so today is going to be an interesting topic. I'm looking forward to this because this is something um, I'm I'm pregnant right now. I and I've had lots of lab tests recently, so um, mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to talking about this. <laughs> so um, this we're going to do an overview of common lab tests, and we're mm-hmm. going to learn what our lab tests say about our health. Yeah. Um, so the majority of the tests that we're going to talk about today are blood tests. Mm-hmm. So I kind of want to just start with just like a couple of. Big picture understanding things for those of us who did not go to four years of medical school and then residency and then have 30 years as practitioners. So, Dr. Tadros, what is blood? Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, whenever whenever you cut yourself on the playground, that red stuff that pours out yes. of uh, your knee or Other whatever Other than gushy, else. squishy, disgusting, right. t- metallic right. tasting... Those are like the oh, only yeah. major descriptors so you that must I have. have had some blood in your mouth. <laughs> yeah, blood has a special taste uh, in your mouth. And it, uh, whenever you poop it out in your stool, which is not normal, uh, especially if it's uh, from upper. Uh, it has, it's, it has a special taste. Then, has, has a special no, no smell. It. Special smell. <laughs> not a special. No, no, do not be. Do, do not taste your blood in your poop. Okay. But anyway, but seriously. But no, it, blood blood is not exactly what it seems. Blood looks red uh, whenever it comes out of your body, whenever you donate blood or whenever you give blood in, in small tubes when, for your blood tests uh, or whenever you bleed on the playground. Uh, so uh, blood typically looks uh, red, sometimes bright red, sometimes a little darker red, but it's kind of, it's red. Uh, but it's made out of many, many components. And we're going to kind of break down some of the components um, and talk about uh, what, 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 it, what it is. Blood is, is the main transport uh, uh, fluid liquid in your body. Okay. It's, uh, it's a, it's a, I mentioned way back with, with hypertension. We have a closed, unlike uh, mo- mollusks, unlike clams, and, and, uh, <laughs> right. which has an open circulatory yes. system. Somewhere in high school biology or junior high biology. I just took zoology last year, oh, actually. Oh, so I'm, I'm freshen up on the Super. open circulatory system. So we have knowledge. a close. We, we're mammals. We have, <laughs> we have a close. We have a close. We're warm blooded. <laughs> Warm blood means we regulate our temperature, so we're warm blooded. Uh, it's not necessarily just because we have warm blood, but it's we're, we're warm yeah. blooded. We regulate our temperature no matter what the outside. Uh, uh, so we do it because we sit in houses. We do it because we put on clothing, but we also will shiver uh, so that we, we we can generate heat. But anyway, we're we're uh, so blood is uh, is in our closed circulatory system. Uh, the the main part of our closed circulatory system is our heart, um, uh, and 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 it pumps in these tubes, uh, blood vessels, uh, all the, over our body and the blood comes back from the, where we sent it, whether it's anywhere from your top of your head to the bottom of your feet, and it comes back to the heart. So it kind of goes mm-hmm. out the left part of the heart and comes back t- through the lungs, uh, uh, I'm sorry, through, through, through the, to the right part of the heart. So I won't involve the lungs right now. Uh, so blood uh, is the main, one of the main ways we transport stuff around our body. We can transport it through the electrical system and, and uh, we could transport it through our lymphatic system. But really blood is, uh, is the major transport medium uh, for, to get things around our body. Sure. So it's a it's a bunch of different things sort of dissolved in water, basically. That's so right. That's right. genetic material... Mm-hmm. nutrients, mm-hmm. so proteins, sugars, fats, vitamins, and minerals, things mm-hmm. that we get from what we eat right. or medications that we take, uh, hormones move through our blood, so insulin, cortisol, testosterone, estrogen, 
Um, and of course, oxygen is carried through the blood. Big so deal. deoxygenated blood is bright, is red, right? It's, it's a little darker. It's darker a little darker red. red. Yeah, and it's oxygenated not... blood is actually blue in our veins. Well, correct? no, actually, oxygenated is a little brighter red. Oh, okay. They're well, both. They're see... both. They're good. No, nothing's going to come out of our body that looks blue. <laughs> if anything comes out of our body that looks blue, we're in trouble. Uh, but but it's uh, deoxygenated is a little more blue. A little more dark. It's a little darker. Okay, gotcha. Uh, red. Uh, but yeah, nothing. Nothing that. Uh, Bright red. And, or so. Yeah, and okay. whenever we draw blood, when we give blood to, to the red cross or 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 you draw blood to check your your blood levels of whatever uh we're checking in the veins yeah. uh, so these are happy to be blood coming back, back. to the back to the heart so, to, yeah, so it's deoxygenated so that's about as okay. dark as it gets uh in a normal healthy person gotcha okay so uh, you know knowing that all of those different things are carried through the blood what kinds of things can affect what's in our blood so yeah. obviously what we eat right that's right um, infections, so mm-hmm. know, illnesses, viruses, viruses, bacteria, f- fungi, uh, uh, spirochetes. You never heard of spirochetes? Nope. Uh, parasites. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, all sorts of uh, interesting stuff can can cause blood is sterile. By the way, before we go too far, blood is perfectly sterile, um, like the inside of a potato. Uh, people don't know this. Uh, hmm. This is uh, this is this this is what we should talk about whenever we're in junior high and stuff like that. Yeah. So the inside of an apple that's uh, an inside of a potato is sterile. This is how in the old days. This is how they used to figure out uh, culture wise. Uh, this is what you used to do. But anyway. Uh, but uh, so our blood is sterile. Uh, if we do get bacteria in there. Uh, for instance, brushing our teeth, we can spread a little bit of bacteria from our mouth into our bloodstream. Mm-hmm. But we have white cells that pick them out very quickly, so it doesn't circulate for very long. But really, our blood is sterile. If you take our blood out of our body and put it to sterile tubes and put it onto sterile uh, petri dishes that where they grow stuff out, mm-hmm. let's pretend uh, stuff sh- uh, no, nothing should That's grow out, grow. essentially. Yeah. yeah, okay, interesting. Okay, so we said uh, nutrition, infections can affect uh, what's in our blood, the environment, mm-hmm. our age... Yep, right, that's right. Um, that's exercise, correct. and also the function of our organs can affect what's that's in our right. blood too, as well. That's right. Part of the reason we we are looking using the blood to help us understand about the rest of our body. Uh, all of our other organs. We don't have to biopsy your kidney or biopsy your brain. We can tell, you know, we don't have to biopsy your muscles. We can tell some of these things that are that are from your liver and your kidney and your bone marrow are, are sitting in your bloodstream where we can access it very easily or else we'd be in trouble. We'd have to go to the organ uh, organ of, of, of interest and, and yeah. take pieces of it. Take pieces. And by the way, the blood is circulating in your bloodstream. It's not made in your bloodstream. Right. So we'll come back to that. That's a pretty cool story. Yeah. So, um, th- I mean, that kind of leads into the next question. So, why are labs a routine part of testing for yeah. diseases? Even sure. e- we're, if we're not looking for a specific bloodborne infection, we're right. looking for, we want to see how our liver is functioning or our kidneys or our metabolism, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Why Why do we go to the blood? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, well, there's a bunch of reasons. Uh, number one, right now we have to, uh, the way that we do it now is the way we've done it for decades, is we have to put a needle in you. Uh, in order to, this is the standard blood test, like your blood sugar and kidney and liver numbers and stuff like that. We typically have to either prick your finger, which is not a blood vessel directly, but small vessels, capillaries, and take it up into a small tube and then run the test. Or more likely, they're going to take a bigger needle and put it in your uh, in your uh, upper in your arm in your arm and and use some vacuum tubes to to suck out blood um, and then send it for testing. So uh, uh, blood uh, that's how we extract it from your body. Either finger prick, which is not the standard way for lots of blood tests, is a good way to get just something like blood sugar or, or, or creatinine, kidney number. But the main way that you typically have seen or seen your fam- family or parents or whatever is that they stick it in your antecubital fossa, uh, which is the inside of your elbow, um, um, not the elbow, the pointy side, but the other side of the pointy side. And then they draw, they, it's hard to do it without, I need to wave my hands more. Uh, maybe they can see me through the podcast. But anyway, but they draw it up and that's, and that's how the blood is, uh, is obtained. Um, um, and you could be fasting or non-fasting. Um, you can take medicine or not take medicines. There's different conditions, different reasons to be fasting or not fasting or have taken medicine or not taken medicines uh, whenever they draw blood, depending what the doc or nurse practitioner or physician assistant is trying to ascertain. Uh, but... Um, uh, but uh, that's it's kind of like a bi- it's kind of like a biopsy it's kind of like a, a snapshot okay. of what's happening in your body for that moment essentially sure mm-hmm. yeah so as you said so many things are communicated through the blood right. about about our health um, about the way our, our systems are functioning it's kind of the best way to get an idea a, right. a snapshot if you will of what's mm-hmm. going on in the body so today you're going to take us through um, the most common lab tests that are going to be ordered by our doctors. 
Um, most of these are blood tests. We'll talk about urinalysis as well, which is obviously an analysis of your urine and not blood. Um, but I've asked Dr. Tadros to sort of like slowly go through these for us because these are going to sure. be some words that we haven't heard before, some, some you know, th- th- phrases and terms that might be new to us. Um, I'm absorbing this as fresh information, just like all of you listening are as well. So, Dr. Tadros, will you tell us about each of these tests and why our doctor might order one? Mm-hmm. Um, and then also give us some examples of, as you're explaining these, of, you know, times these specific tests helped you identify something important in one of your patients. Yeah. And by the way, right now, um, you get a lab order and you make an appointment with the lab uh, and you go get your blood drawn or you give your urine sample. or to, to, uh, So we tend not to do it at home. Eventually, we're going to have, we, right now we have continuous glucose monitors, so which is another way of looking at, uh, but, but we're going to get more and more data more and more real-time data, just like you can wear a pulse, you know, uh, you can check your pulse or oxygen on, mm-hmm. on a watch. Uh, you, we're going to get more and more data. That that's stuff, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's right. So we're going to get more and more data. Uh, uh, it's in real time, uh, you know, multiple times a day, maybe mm-hmm. multiple times an hour even, uh, uh, to give feedback to, well, if I, ate, if I eat, uh, eat a, a potato, you know, what, what does that do to my sugar? What does that do to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, other, uh, you know, my insulin levels? So it, it's, it's going to, we're going to get more and more data that's going to be more easily available um, um, at, at home, essentially. Sure. Through some uh, of these wearable technologies. That's right. The very cool. Yeah. yeah. Cool. That's going to be very cool stuff. So, um, yeah. And, and a lot of times, whenever you go to your patient portal, this is a, you see a physician or nurse practitioner. Yeah, your 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 electronic medical record. You can go patient portal. They'll post your blood test results. Uh-huh. Um, uh, uh, I, I in this case, uh, you can you so typically in, in the St. Louis area we have LabCorp and 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 Quest are the big ones. There are a bunch of other small labs, and all the hospitals have labs, obviously too, laboratories. Uh, so and you oftentimes can see your numbers, and they'll see the, the normal range, mm-hmm. the reference range or the normal range for your age or sex, uh, because they, that's altered. It's not always, uh, but we'll come back to that. But it's not always does not just because it says normal range, you're inside or outside normal range doesn't always mean that you have to be worried. And sure. that's that's why it's important to have somebody who who ordered it to help you interpret, interpret it. Results. Interpret it. It's yeah. not enough just to read it and uh, and pat yourself on the back or freak out. So you have yep. to have somebody help you interpret these laboratory results. Okay. So you want to start with a comprehensive meta- metabolic panel? Yeah, su- super. Uh, so uh, it's, it's called a CMP, C for Charlie, M for Mary, P for Peter, comprehensive or complete metabolic panel. You like to think like, well, that's it. I, I've, I've done the whole thing. I, I don't mm-hmm. need anything else. It, this is only, uh, it's a set of, 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 of individual blood tests that's in a panel that helps tell you about your blood sugar, your sodium, your potassium, your carbon what do you mean dioxide. When you say panel? A pan, I'm sorry. What do you mean when you say panel? It's just it's a listing. It's just a listing. It's okay. just it's just a list of of of, of blood individual blood tests that they've chosen to put together so that you don't have to order them individually. So this is actually kind of a, a combination of blood tests right. that's called that's sort of printed all together right. in a in a list of results. Okay. Right. You could ha- or you, the doc can order these separately or individually. It would be torture for everybody. But <laughs> but, uh, but so this yeah. is just a panel that we think. And so they use the same vial of blood to run all of these tests that's at right. one time. That's correct. Right? Okay. That's so correct. it's kind of yeah. Yeah. yeah, one one vial one vital blood can run multiple different panels. In fact, Great. not just just one panel. Uh, so uh, so in this case, it'll look at your it'll look at your uh, sodium, your potassium, uh, your blood sugar, your your kidney numbers like BUN, blood urea, nitrogen, and creatinine. It'll look at your liver numbers, what we call liver numbers, but it's liver numbers are not just about the liver, about other things too. Um, Look at your bicarb, your your acid base balance. So it looks at a bunch of different things, um, and that's a standard one. Uh, so the, that's and we'll start with that one. Once again, blood work value, reference values or what the normal range is uh, is oftentimes posted next to your lab results. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's hard to tell the difference. It's sometimes you have to read it to understand where they where they put things on the, your screen. Um, uh, we'll start with <clears throat> the sodium. Sodium, uh, you've heard of salt. You know the salt that you put on your your, your table. Um, is, that's sodium chloride. If you if there's a there's a sodium which is a uh, an ion, or it's just, it's it's an it's a it's a the sodium chloride is a molecule. We'll go back to basics. Sodium mo- chloride is a molecule. It's made out of two atoms: an atom of sodium and an atom of chloride. 
Well, it turns out sodium is, the, is probably uh, makes up about half of the total uh, product that's dissolved in your blood. It's okay. a bunch of stuff dissolved in your blood. Half of uh, the, of all the stuff dissolved in your blood is uh, almost half is about is made out of sodium, and sodium tends to be outside your cells. So it's an extracellular outside your cells. So it's in your bloodstream, but it's not. So it tends to be outside your brain cells, outside your kidney cells, it's outside your liver cells. It can go inside your cells, but mainly it's held outside your cells. And your body has lots of mechanisms, several mechanisms to help make sure it's regulated in a certain tight range, so that whenever you eat a big salty meal, the salt in your bloodstream does not go up through the roof. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for people to understand. They said, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm swollen in my legs. You know, I, you know, I need to check my salt levels and stuff like that. But even if you're eating a lot of salt, even if you're retaining a lot of fluids, it does not necessarily show up uh, automatically as, uh, as a high uh, mm. so, so, uh, sodium. So right. people, just because they hear sodium and they hear uh, edema or swelling, it does not necessarily mean that your sodium is, uh, is high. So the alkalinity in our body kind of has a, uh, a homeostasis, like a, a kind right. of a... Bit, a you know, a balance point that it stays at. Sol a salinity. Uh -huh. Yeah, you said alkalinity. Salinity. Yeah, salinity. Not alkalinity. That's yes, right. right. Yeah. yeah. So that's correct. And that's 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 the whole body is is a uh, homeostasis is just a way of 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 uh, uh, keeping something in a certain range, mm -hmm. a balance. So a certain balance. And it turns out that your your body, your brain. Your your enzymes, your proteins work within a certain range of everything, okay. whether it's whether it's uh, pH or acidity or alkalinity, temperature, all that stuff like that. So your body is a big home uh, is a big homeostatic mechanism, and there's trade offs. Sometimes there's trade offs. In order for you to live, uh, you know, we trade off certain things. We trade off certain things, and mm -hmm. that's that's where sometimes disease uh, enters whenever you can't keep homeostasis. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, with the normal body responses. Sure. So sodium is in your foods. Uh, sodium comes out in your sweat. Sodium comes out, a little bit comes out in your urine. Some, some of it comes out a little bit in your stool. But sodium it, it tends to be conserved quite a bit because your body recognizes that we, we old statement, water follows salt. So if you keep sodium in your body, your body tends to keep water in your body. Water mm -hmm. in your body as part of plasma and serum in your bloodstream, water in your body, especially in your in your cells, brain cells, liver cells, kidney cells, all those cells. So that's a very important thing. Um, sometimes we'll see low sodiums uh, whenever you get rid of sodium, either you've not had very much sodium. So some people are very restri restrictive on their sodium diet, low sodium diet, <coughs> and they will... <clears throat> And they will actually have low sodiums because they have not, uh, their body loses a little bit of sodium and it tries to hold on to it. Uh, whenever it notices that you're not drinking or you're not eating much soda, salt. Uh, but sometimes I've had some older folks that take, whenever we tell them, hey, your, your salt, you know, re reduce your salt because it helps your blood pressure. And they are so restrictive that their salt drops, mm -hmm. uh, their sodium drops, their sodium uh, levels. So that's an important thing to recognize. Sometimes it's a decreased intake. Not usually that. The next most likely thing for what, what I see in my practice is that they're on a diuretic, something that gets rid of salt to help get rid of water. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we force your kidneys through a diuretic Lasix or hydrochlorothiazide or chlorothaldone, if we force your body to get rid of salt in your urine, excess salt, then the water, you tend to pee more. That's how mm -hmm. a diuretic works. A, a, a good chunk of these is that they let get rid of salt, not through your skin, through the sweat, but through your kidney, then you end up peeing more, so mm -hmm. you end up losing water weight. In fact, in the old days, this is how this is how wrestlers made weight and, and, and body and body uh, and um, uh, and bodybuilders to get their yeah. their, their skin tight Look, on their uh, skin, cuts. yeah stuck yeah. so they dehydrated themselves and, and and wrestlers in high school and stuff would get into trouble uh, they would get uh, they would get severe problems because they would sweat themselves and they'd take diuretics they'd sweat themselves in plastic plastic uh, workout uh, gear uh, they call it cut weight or make weight and stuff like that so make their weight class and so they got into a lot of trouble so nowadays uh, they they test the the the, the, the uh, the uh, osmolality, the, the specific gravity of your urine to make sure that you're not dehydrating yourself mm -hmm. so that, you're, that you have to have a certain range uh, for these people not to cut, you know, you could cut easily three, five pounds easily within within a few hours of taking a diuretic and you could cut 10 pounds, literally, just losing water weight uh, by trying to sweat it off uh, and, and, and diuretics. Sure. So you're, in these people, the salt uh, the salt may, may uh, be altered. Uh, so that's the uh, that's the first thing. Decreasing your unless you're severe severe salt restriction, you won't see the salt uh, sodium in your blood um, uh, be altered. 
Uh, so can't go by that. Um, potassium is the next uh, one. Uh, you've heard of potassium uh, because people get leg cramps. So potassium is intracellular, as opposed to sodium may be, be, being mainly outside the cells in your body. Potassium is mainly inside the cells of your body. And potassium is important for a lot of things, muscle function, nerve function. Um, um, and potassium is also, uh, whenever we, whenever uh, you, you can, if your blood level of potassium is too low, oftentimes it's because you're on a diuretic. Uh, that's one of the things. So a lot of times whenever people are on diuretics for because of heart failure or because of blood pressure, we actually have to give them potassium so that they don't waste too much of the potassium in their bloodstream. So, uh, so good. Uh, so Potassium is uh, is also highly conserved. Your body has a mechanism uh, mechanisms mainly through the kidneys to conserve potassium. Potassium is important for your heart function, electrical activity in your heart. In fact, some people with a very high potassiums and kidney failure, very low potassiums, and, and with diuretics, uh, can have arrhythmias and death specifically from uh, from uh, uh, alterations in, mm-hmm. in potassium levels. Um, Are but, these all electrolytes? That's right. Okay. That's kind of like your ba- kind of like your battery, like your battery okay. juice and stuff yeah. like that. Um, uh, the, uh, the chloride, uh, is, uh, you've heard of potassium chloride and you've heard of sodium chloride. Chloride is not as important, but they do report it out. It's not as important. So I'll skip over it right now. Bicarbonate, uh, you know, you've heard of sodium bicarbonate mm-hmm. in your, in your, in your, in your, in your, in your pantry. Uh, bicarb is part of the acid base. So this baking is. Baking soda. Yeah, baking soda. soda. So this is, this is part of your acid base in your body. You, you have multiple things that control your acidity uh, or your alkalinity, um, your blood pH, your, uh, your, your, um, um, your concentration of hydrogen atoms, this is, uh, which is your um, logarithmic, uh, uh, logarithmic uh, um, uh, concentration of your hydrogen atoms uh, gives you your pH. And your pH of plain old normal water, distilled water is 7.0. Mm-hmm. The pH scale goes from 0 to 14. 0 is super acidic and 14 is very basic or alkaline. So you're right about water. Your blood. Uh, if you're not not a. Uh, if you don't have kidney failure. If you don't have liver failure. If you don't not an emphysema patients, your blood pH uh, is about seven point four. So it's almost seven point zero. So it's uh, just slightly so more basic. Sl- than, slightly than more than basic water. than yeah. than water. Okay. Uh, and so um, so uh, so the bicarbonate um, helps us understand. It's not uh, you, you can't you can't calculate directly from the bicarbonate what your pH is. But you can tell if your pH your bicarbonate is low. That that there uh, that, that there's some acidity in your body that your bicarbonate had to go neutralize in order to keep the pH close to seven point four. Okay. So that's how. You, so if it's low, if your bicarbonate is high, that means that you have some extra alkalinity or, uh, in your in your body. But your body is once again homeostatic, homeostatically wants to keep your bicarbonate a certain tight l- level uh, so that your your enzymes, your proteins uh, can function properly. Um, um, and this is controlled by metabolics of your of your body, um, uh, and also by your respiratory system. Because mm-hmm. you know, remember that uh, that you can have uh, you could hyperventilate and cause alkalosis in your body temporarily, uh, and you can hold your breath too long, and you could cause acidosis in your body. So your bicarbonate helps balance some of that stuff out. Um, the next one is uh, is. Uh, 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 BUN, it's a bun or blood, urea, and nitrogen. Nitrogen in our body, uh, you know, remember, nitrogen makes about 78% of our atmosphere. Uh, so uh, nitrogen in our body mainly is in proteins. So BUN is actually part of the proteins that we eat. Uh, so this is waste product. This is coming out, uh, eventually it'll come out in your urine, but this is in your blood right now. So BUN, uh, blood, urea, nitrogen. So uh, nitrogen is in, in a form of a molecule called urea. It's a waste product uh, for our needs. But that's, uh, that helps us understand a little bit about your protein metabolism. If your BUN is high, it's either because you're having a big protein, uh, you're, you have a lot of protein in your diet, or you're dehydrated. Uh, mm. This is one mm-hmm. of the things that we can see with dehydration. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's one of the, we'll call it kidney number. The other main kidney number is your creatinine. 
People hear about creatine, which is a powder that you that weight, weight, weightlifters use. Yeah, to build muscle. That's right, creatine. And creatine or, uh, is not is not what this is. It's called creatinine. And creatinine is also a waste product from our muscle, uh, but it goes to, mainly through our kidneys. And so this is what, what we call these BUN and creatinine are both kind of our kidney function numbers. Mm-hmm. Kidneys also affect a lot of other things, but we'll call these our kidney function. And creatinine is also, uh, this is our, how much... Um, our ability to get rid of waste products. This is liquid waste. Right? We have um, uh, we have uh, uh, volatile waste that we breathe out. We have uh, non-volatile stuff that uh, we pee out. Um, uh, and, uh, liquid, and so this is the stuff that's so creatinine is the stuff that's uh, uh, that goes through our kidneys. It's not reabsorbed in our kidneys to go back in our bloodstream. Mm-hmm. So we have to, we're getting rid of it. So very low creatinine could mean that you don't have very you're not eating very much protein. It could also mean that you don't have very much muscle mass. You're not very muscular and stuff like that. People are wasting away. So low creatinine could happen when people have stopped eating uh, for, for because of depression, because of uh, drug abuse, because they have anorexia nervosa. Uh, you know, so the creatinine is another way to look at our. Our, our kidney function, but also some of our, our protein. Uh, so these waste products are in from the kidneys are in the blood on their way to be filtered right. out through our urine. That's right. Correct? You got it. You got okay. it. And then estimated GFR, estimated glomerular filtration rate, is just another way to look at uh, kidney function. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, and that's its own. Uh, and you'll and sometimes estimated GFR tells us about kidney failure, chronic kidney disease. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the big causes for elevated creatinine in the United States is chronic. That means it's persistent. It's oftentimes getting worse. Is hypertension and diabetes. Those are big things that attack your kidneys. And you can get chronic kidney disease where you have rising creatinine. Serum creatinine is rising over many years. Um, and uh, your estimated GFR is going down. Uh, your ability to filter waste products is going down. It's getting less effective. That's why eventually you get on a filtering machine called mm-hmm. dialysis. Mm-hmm. Um, then we have total protein. Uh, this is not all the protein in your body. You have structural protein. That's the stuff in your muscles. Mm-hmm. That's not what we're measuring. We're measuring the stuff floating around that's diluted in your blood. Uh, so total protein helps us understand about your nut- nutritional status. And albumin is a, is a, is a, type, of, uh, is a type of protein. So albumin is the other uh, test here that also tells us about nutritional status. So uh, you could have high protein or high albumin in select cases where you're eating, where you're eating a lot of uh, uh, protein, including meats, uh, but it also can happen whenever um, uh, your, your bone marrow uh, is making a lot of uh, excess protein, special proteins, because some of these proteins are immunoglobulins. Mm. So your body could make a lot of immunoglobulins in certain types of uh, 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 lymphomas and also with multiple myeloma. So you may have high proteins, but it's not, it's not nutritional. It's not your muscle. Uh, it's actually immune globulins that are being made abnormally as part of your bone marrow. So you can see that first here. Mm-hmm. And that's how we picked up, I've picked up uh, all my all my multiple myeloma patients, um, which is a, uh, a type of a type of white cell disease, but it mm-hmm. makes makes a lot of these uh, immunoglobulins that are proteins, and then uh, then we get into a couple of things I call liver functions, but they're, they're beyond liver functions. Uh, so there's um, there's uh, uh, the ALT, uh, the alanine aminotransferase, called the ALT in the old days. Uh, uh, we called it other things, but this, uh, I think everything says ALT nowadays. Uh, the ALT is uh, made by, is from inside the liver cells, hepatocytes, uh, liver cells. Um, and um, whenever your liver is sick, acute hepatitis, infl- infection or inflammation of the liver with like, uh, with uh, if you give, eat too much Tylenol or you have too much alcohol and causes um, alcoholic uh, uh, hepatitis, or you have a virus like hepatitis B or hepatitis C, these, all these things eventually can lead to elevated ALT because the liver cells are dying. The, the insides of the liver cells are, the ALT is being sp- spilled in the bloodstream. It goes up significantly, two, three, five, ten times uh, uh, upper limits of normal uh, for, uh, for acute liver uh, disease, mm-hmm. uh, so acute liver inflammation. Uh, if you get if you're in a car accident and your liver and your liver and, uh, and spleen get hit by, by you know um, you can see that just elevation just because of just trauma even if you don't drink uh, so that's uh, so that's one quote unquote liver that's mainly for the liver so we don't see that very much elsewhere then there's a, a sister compound called AST the first one's ALT next was AST the uh, aspartate amino transferase. Um, and that stuff is AST is also in the liver, but it's also in a lot of other things in brain and heart and muscle. So in the old days, before we had fancy tests, this is back in med school and before, 
we used to look at uh, for the AST as a sign of a heart attack because mm. it was in heart muscle, just like it's in skeletal muscle and it's in brain, it's in liver. So when the AST is elevated, you sometimes go looking for other things to see. It helps you understand if it's if what, what, what organ is coming from. But that also could be a liver, uh, we call it liver number, but it comes from other things too. Also, uh, that's from acute infection or acute inflammation or acute injury. Um, then there's something called alkaline phosphatase, alkaline phosphatase or ALP. Alkaline phosphatase comes also from the liver, but also comes from prostate and bone. Uh, it comes from intestines. Uh, it comes, I think, from placenta. Uh, so there's different types of AL, uh, alkphos. Um, uh, in the old days, whenever one of the ways is uh, prostatic alkphos, it was from the prostate, and uh, people with prostate cancer would have an elevated alkphos, uh, and that's w- w- prostatic fraction, the piece of it that was from the prostate. Uh, but once again, it comes from the alkphos comes from a bunch of different things. The liver is one of them, um, and then uh, then bilirubin. Bilirubin only come is as, as you can hear, but bilirubin comes from bile. It comes from the kind of the lining of your uh, gallbladder and the ducts that re- lead you gallbladder remember bile is a soapy material that's made in your liver it's stored in your in your gallbladder and then the gallbladder is like a soap dispenser it, squ- it squirts as food comes past the small mm-hmm. intestines it squirts out uh, and so if if your gallbladder is sick uh, 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 if you've got stones and it's trying to squeeze against the stones the stones are pl- pl- preventing it from squeezing out stuff you can get colicky pain or pain in your gallbladder and uh, that's uh, that also uh, will raise your uh, your uh, total bilirubin because you're obstructing your gallbladder mm. um, and also eventually you can elevate your alk foss your, so these are uh, total bilirubin and alk foss will go up uh, oftentimes in people with gallbladder disease where they can't squeeze out the bile so they've got sludge or stones in the bile so those are one of the things so patient comes into the emergency room uh, says I've every you know within a couple hours of eating my right upper belly hurts I want to puke, and they draw blood on them. This comprehensive metabolic panel, and they see the alkphos and and the and the total bilirubin is elevated. It gives them a and without the ALT and AST elevated, it gives you hints of obstruction of the gallbladder. Mm. So it kind of narrows it down for you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, that was the comprehensive metabolic panel, That's correct? Right. You are correct. So l- let's just say, like for a second, about metabolism is is the the chemical process that our bodies go through to maintain Uh life right i mean that is that's really what it's about so Uh um why so it sounds like there's you know a a bunch of different reasons why the doctor might order one is this a fairly common lab test that's right so it's oftentimes routine part of physicals okay uh, for 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 adults adults they don't typically have to do this for youngsters for going in for their shots or anything yeah Okay, gotcha. To catch a whole host of things. Okay, mm-hmm. so let's move on to complete blood count with platelets and differential. Yeah, you'd think that the first one that says comprehensive metabolic panel, uh, that should be everything. But yeah. then, then the next one says complete, that was a lot. complete blood count. It's like, well, surely this is it. And surely we're, but this one's mainly bone marrow. Uh, this is with the stuff that's made in the bone marrow that we see in the, out in the bloodstream. So it's your white cells and a bunch of different types of white cells, your WBC's white blood cell count, and a bunch of differential, different, different types. Um, this is your uh, hemoglobin habanacrit. That's the red stuff that carries oxygen. That's the protein that's bound with, with iron that is able to hold on to oxygen and transport around your body. Uh, and then your platelets. Uh, your platelets are the stuff that makes helps make scabs and clots. Mm-hmm. So all this stuff is made in your bone marrow. Um, uh, well, actually, whenever you're a baby, it turns out your liver and your spleen make some of these uh, a little bit in your bone marrow. And then uh, uh, when you're a f- uh, fetus, um, and then as you, as, as you, uh, after you're born and stuff, the liver and spleen shut down their ability to make uh, the, these red blood cells and, uh, and then your bone marrow takes over. Not all your bone marrow, the long bones in your thigh bone and your breast bone and your pelvic bone. So whenever people uh, used to give bone marrow transplants, all that stuff, they would actually stick needles into your breastbone or your mm-hmm. or your pelvic bone to suck out some of the stuff in order to give it to somebody else. Uh, so uh, that's but this is a miracle of uh, your bones are attached to your blood uh, your bloodstream it helps feed your bones so that the, the the oxygen and nutrients and the and the bone marrow inside the bones inside the hard part of these select bones, the long bones and the breast bones and the pelvic bones, uh, feed, uh, put blood cells into, into, into the bloodstream, the white cells, the, the platelets and the, and the red cells. Yeah. Okay. 
So um, what is what does the differential part mean? Yes, the, the different parts of the white cells, the oh. different just the different types of things, the white cells that fight infection. Okay, so a complete blood count is an a, a, a total breakdown, right? That's of, right. Of the the types of blood cells in a certain volume of liquid. That's correct? right. That's or right. A volume of blood. Okay. That's right. You got it. Gotcha. All right. Um, let's move on to lipid panel. Yeah, lipid panel. Lipids are fats. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, so people have heard about their cholesterol and stuff like that. I want people to remember whenever you buy a bottle, almost any bottle of canola or olive oil, it'll say zero cholesterol. But you look at the bottle, it's all fat. Yeah. So I want people to understand we may have some cholesterol, especially if you eat meats and stuff like that. You may have some cholesterol in uh, with your with your fats, dairy, but, and yeah, dairy um, and stuff like that. But a lot of stuff out there, all all oil, all fat has zero cholesterol in it. Yep. So it's, your body ends up, every cell in your body could make cholesterol, but some of the cells need to make more. And so they, since they can't make it, your liver makes it for them. And it's transported uh, it, from your liver to uh, where it's needed. And if you have extra cholesterol because you ate poorly, you have bad genetics, then some of that extra cholesterol ends up inside your arteries, inside the lining of your arteries, mm. and it's oxidized. So, uh, so Plaque? Your plaque, okay, right? Yeah, that's right. So, that's correct. Okay, it's like it. deposits on the lining of your In, of inside. Arteries. That's right. Okay, it kind yeah. of wedges itself. Yeah, it wedges mm-hmm. itself inside blood vessels, especially the ones to your heart or to your brain. Therefore, it can increase your risk for heart attacks or strokes. Mm-hmm. So that's why we worry about lipids. It's not because we're worried about the numbers. It's just what we're worried about after years. In fact, they did studies. This is back Vietnam. Uh, 18-year-olds, of course, went to war and they were killed. And they did autopsies on 18-year-olds and they were already getting fatty streaks in the arteries of the heart. So even at age 18, some of this fat that was extra fat was already starting to line their coronary arteries, their arteries to feed their heart. Um, so, uh, is that because of their diets or because of right. environmental toxins right. they're exposed to? Or what? That's correct. Yeah, that's a good question. We assume that it's diet, dietary, but that's a good question. If, if some of these people already had bad family histories yeah. or uh, for, for early heart disease or uh, some people have very special genes that give them super high cholesterol and super high triglycerides, even if they have a great diet. Mm-hmm. So these people, unfortunately, sometimes some people with some certain familial hereditary or familial uh, hi- hyperlipidemia syndromes uh, can have heart attacks in their 20s. Wow. Yeah, so that's uh, those are very special, uh, rare, but special uh, people mm-hmm. that, uh, that we can learn it from. It is uh, like the mm-hmm. CMP and CBC's the lipid panel ca- a t- a sure. t- routine blood test, or is it, it is. the kind of thing that would be ordered right. to trace a specific It is. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be ordered every year. If you're healthy and you don't have family history for heart disease or stroke, uh, they can check it once every five, starting somewhere in your, uh, in your, uh, in your uh, somewhere you should get it probably in your teens to make sure there's nothing uh, abnormal, and then they can check every five years if there's nothing wrong if you don't have a family history you're not obese uh, you know and you're not diabetic then they could check it every five years but otherwise if you're on if you need medicines it's not unusual to check it two or three times a year to make okay. sure that your your medicines are working mm-hmm. but it, it has the uh, hdl high density lipoprotein mm-hmm. uh, part of the total cholesterol it has the ldl low density lipoprotein of the total cholesterol um and uh and uh, then it has triglycerides which right. are not not which are another type of fat that are not that's not part of the cholesterol directly so HDL is healthy, well, good. High, but yeah, which the, one? Yeah, it's it's, it's we, the old statement is high is happy. So high is happy. Okay. High is happy is HDL as H. So H uh-huh. for uh, HDL. That is not quite true, but it kind of gives you a rough idea. But it's uh-huh. not quite true. Some people have super high good cholesterols, uh, b- uh, the quote unquote good or uh, right. protective HDL uh, of the cholesterol. But actually, it's not as protective as we thought. And maybe actually, a side of that things are bad. And the and the total number is really what's more important. Well. Right? It's it's actually, actually, it's more complicated than that. We, oh, in the okay. old days, yeah, in the old days, we used to think it was total and then the bad, and the, we kind of ignored the good. But then we recognized that the good has protective properties. Then we realized that there's different types of good within mm. the good. Then there's different types of bad within the bad. Right. And so, you know, so the, it becomes much, much more complicated. In fact, people can get uh, separate, uh, uh, we call them lipidologists. These are these are the cholesterol, the cholesterol and fats people. Wow. They could be primary care doctors that get extra training, or they could be cardiologists that get extra training. And it's a whole field by itself self of kind of a subspecialization um, uh, but but uh, but yes, and so when people say my cholesterol my cholesterol is two twenty, uh, so what they're saying is that uh, you know that their cholesterol level that's a total yeah. cholesterol T C C H O C H O L E S T R O L total cholesterol is two twenty, 
and then there's depending on the age and depending on also disease states. So if you have a, if you already had a heart attack and you're you're 45, they're going to want your cholesterol much lower than somebody who has no uh, no heart disease. Um, and uh, so 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 that's the problem whenever it comes to looking at the normals on the side because the lab doesn't know what cholesterol medicines are. The lab doesn't know that you had a heart attack or stroke. Sure. So the lab will just put something up there that's uh, that's uh, roughly correct for most people who who are who are heart disease free. Uh, but but the but the targets are very important. Mm-hmm. Uh, oftentimes, it's diet and exercise is important, and then oftentimes lipid lowering agents like statins, mm-hmm. like the Lipitor's and stuff like that, is manipulated. It becomes very complicated because um, um, uh, your weight alters your lipids. Uh, um, if you're dieting, if you're I'm sorry, if you've been fasting and before the blood tests are not fasting, um, if you're if you're diabetic. So all sorts of things affect your lipid panel, mm. and it's much more complicated than just the old-fashioned total cholesterol. And here's your good cholesterol, bad cholesterol. Here's your ratio. Too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, triglycerides. Mm-hmm. We want to keep relatively low. Yes. Right? Yeah. High triglycerides is not a good thing. That's correct. Okay. So high triglycerides we kind of underestimate, but it probably is a kind of a. Uh, uh, it's it's probably a. a um, a canary in the coal mine whenever it comes to people that have high triglycerides, borderline blood sugars, uh, or overweight and stuff like that, then we start worrying that these people may be pre-diabetic, et cetera. Uh, so, uh, but the, the quick answer is yes. Uh, uh, so we, we, we don't want to ignore uh, the, the triglycerides. We don't want to ignore the bad cholesterol, the LD, bad portion of the total cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol. We don't want to ignore an HDL, the good cholesterol that's too low. Mm-hmm. So all of them matter. Right. Um, it's m- more complicated than, than just hitting the targets. Uh, but uh, in terms of numbers, if you had a heart attack and stuff like that, that's why you need good uh, primary care and good cardiologists oftentimes to help with uh, some of these things. Not everybody can tolerate statins, for instance. And it goes from we it gets complicated very sure. quickly. Yeah. Okay. So uh, next, we'll move on to prostate specific antigen. Obviously, sure. this is a test that works on you know biological males, right? Right. That's right. Um. So talk about that test. Please. Yeah, the PSA or prostate specific antigen. Um. Uh, they came out a few years ago. Uh, the uh, U.S. Preventive Task Force and some other people said, "Stop ordering it. Stop ordering it routinely. You mm. Order it if somebody has symptoms and stuff." Uh, I'm, uh, but we don't have good screening tests for the prostate if we don't use that one. The problem with the PSA and the PSA, the prostate specific antigen, you could, prostate uh, is uh, is at the uh, the base of your uh, underneath your bladder, between your bladder and the and and the penis for men. Uh, that's the only place it should be. Uh, is, is is the prostate? It's about uh, whenever it's not not enlarged, it's about the size of a walnut. Uh, it could become much more large. It could become three, four, five times bigger than a walnut. Uh, it could be massive and structure your uh, your outflow of your urine from your bladder to, 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 to the toilet. But the prostate-specific antigen is made by healthy prostate tissue, enlarging prostate tissue, and cancerous prostate tissue. Hmm. So that's part of the problem. It, if you have, if, if you, after sex, it can go up. If somebody touches your prostate as part of rectal exam, it could go up. Uh, if uh, after masturbation, it can go up. Um, uh, and uh, if you have a prostate infection, prostatitis, it can go up. And if you have prostate cancer, it can go up. So a lot of stuff makes a PSA go up. Hmm. Um, and that's part of the problem we run into. Uh, we have lots of guys and uh, lots of guys that end up seeing urologists uh, because of uh, temporary elevated, elevated PSA, te- yeah. temporarily elevated PSAs that tend to go get better once the infection is gone or they haven't had sex. Even riding a bicycle can potentially raise it. Actually, hmm. uh, mechanical mechanical. A manipulation of the uh, in and around the prostate, so it's kind of tricky number to interpret, uh, and so that we tend to have repeat numbers from the same type of lab. If you go to Quest Labs, you tend to want to go back to Quest over months to years. If you go to LabCorp, you go if you go to Mercy or BJC, you tend to want to go to the same lab because the different reagents, the different techniques uh, uh, can make it just. Auto- you can check at three different places in the, in the St. Louis area uh, and, uh, and get three different numbers, not, not that far apart, but enough to to you would notice. So that's the problem we, we start off with. So uh, oftentimes uh, the PSA, we start typically start African-American uh, men have prostate cancer earlier. We probably start, we should start checking at 45. Some men who've already had prostate cancer because their dad or uncle had prostate cancer may have to have it even earlier. Uh, Caucasian men typically uh, 50 and above. Uh, it's usually an annual test if you are getting it checked, once again, 
Um, there are several organizations that come out and say, stop checking it. We're getting a lot of false mm. uh, false readings. Right. We, 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 we tell you that there may be cancer or it's been elevated, and they biopsy you and put you through a pine, and there's no cancer there. So that's part of the reason what's happened. It's not that we don't pick up cancer. It's that we pick up everything else. Sure. And therefore, we just spend a crap load of money on people. Uh, so that's, that's a good that's example of how you know some of mm-hmm. a lot of testing, a lot of information is not always that's good. That's yeah. right? In fact, in fact, I tend to want to have tests and then and then disregard it if it's negative uh, or if it doesn't make sense and stuff like that. Uh, uh, but 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 economically, and uh, this is what happens. This is how we run up a big bill in the in the in the United States and the world is that we get lots of fancy tests and we end up having to send people. I can't figure it out, so I may follow them for a few months. Then I eventually send them to a urologist, which is more is more expensive, then it's more tests, follows them, stuff like that. So things ratchet up very quickly without any cancer, without mm-hmm. having, you know, stuff like that. And then there's a question about how to treat cancer once you have it. Right. And so, yeah. So is prostate, I mean, this is, you know, outside of the routine testing, but is um, is prostate cancer one of those things that we are are, are in search of better diagnostic tools yes, for? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's a, we, we need, we need, we have better prognosticators. So not everybody who gets prostate cancer has to have surgery or radiation or, or chemo or anything up front. And this is so that you have it now. We have, we're, we're getting in the last decade, 15 years, we have better prognosticators. Once you get the PSA, that's a start. But then there are other tests, uh, urinary and other blood tests potentially, and scans to help us understand the aggressiveness of the cancer. Can we just let it there? And nobody wants to ever hear that they're going to let the cancer grow in you. Uh, but if, if you're 78 and you've got a, a PSA of two and a half, you don't know these numbers, uh, and and it was used to be 1.3, and now it's 2.5, and and we think it's cancer. Sometimes they'll just let it watch it and let it go. Sure. There's certain prognostication uh, number uh, f- uh, indices and other things we can do, to, and other so we don't have to put you through radiation. We don't have to put you through surgery whenever you're 78. Uh, so this is always the issue that we run into is that how long to, I had several patients in their late forties that, you know, that they wanted to, they wanted to follow as opposed to just jump in, even though they were very young, uh, they jump in to do surgery. So they just, they wanted to follow, uh, the, fe- the features, the characteristics, the blood characteristics of the PSA, repeat biopsies sometimes mm-hmm. becomes expensive and, and complicated. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, let's move on to thyroid. So thyroid mm-hmm. stimulating hormone, which I think you said has been renamed, correct? Yeah, they've they've renamed it. Uh, so I'll uh, I'll think of it in a second. But the TSH, uh, so the TSH is the main way besides feeling the pro- uh, the prostate. Huh feeling the thyroid, mm-hmm. which is the front of your neck. So the thyroid looks like a small bow tie uh, uh, that sits in the, underneath the skin and uh, underneath the muscle on the base of your neck, right above your the, the mm-hmm. notch of your sternum, uh, right uh, there. So and what does it do? What does the thyroid do? Yeah, it's, it's, kind, of, yeah, it's kind of like a carburetor. It's kind of like a carburetor. So thyroid hormone <laughs> helps... Thyroid hormone helps uh, a, a variety of things. It helps regulate metabolism uh, throughout your body. Okay. That's one of the. That's w- what it, it, ma- it mainly does. But it helps all sorts of stuff. It helps uh, if you're underactive or overactive. It can uh, affect everything from your sugars to your weight to your, to your bowel, uh, the frequency of your bowel habits to depression to how thick your hair is, how dry your skin is, um, uh, uh, all that stuff. Um, babies in, in utero can become hypothyroid, and they can be, you can get uh, you can get big babies because yep. uh, the mom was hypothyroid, and the baby becomes hypothyroid. Uh, so yeah, so it's a big there's a it's a very important um, blood test to have. Obviously, you're gonna get you you've gotten yours done, I'm sure, mm-hmm. as part of your pregnancy. They'll follow it. It actually alters due to certain protein changes in your bloodstream and stuff like that. So the, the numbers will be, will be altered. Um, uh, so. Um, the number one cause for underactive thyroid in the United States, probably in the world, is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. This is an autoimmune disease that attacks and kills your thyroid. Um, and uh, then these people will have to have thyroid replacement by mouth pills that they take for the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can get blood tests uh, to, to make sure that they're in the right range uh, of TSH, the thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone comes from your anterior, uh, the, the stimulating hormone doesn't come from your thyroid. It has to come from somewhere else to mm. stimulate your thyroid. Right. So it comes from your anterior pituitary. Your pituitary gland sits at the base of your brain. Um, um, very close to the, the nerves that come from the back of your eyeball, for, from your eyeballs to your brain, back of the brains, your eyeballs in the front, uh, right between the eyeballs and the, and the back of your brain. Uh, there's uh, the, 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 the optic nerves, uh, and they cross, and they cross right uh, next to this pituitary gland, and the pituitary gland pushes out the TSH, uh, and, uh, and the th- TSH talks to the thyroid, and the thyroid makes T4, makes a mm-hmm. bunch of other things, but makes T4, 
And if there's enough T4, then it feeds back to your brain and says, okay, this level of TSH is fine. If there's not enough T4 being made in your thyroid gland, then it, it goes back and says, make more TSH, you know, kind of whip whip, mm. the, whip, whip, whip the, uh, the mule a little harder, uh, mule being your thyroid. So, okay, if I'm not making enough, then the brain, uh, the, the anterior pituitary puts out more TSH to tell the, the thyroid to put out more T4. Mm -hmm. If there's too much T4 being made, uh, uh, hyperthyroid, um, uh, then, then it feeds back to the brain and says, slow down the TSH. Don't give me as much TSH. So the TSH may go down mm -hmm. below the normal limits. So this is a feedback loop, a positive and negative feedback loop mm -hmm. uh, between your thyroid and your, and, your, and, your, and your anterior pituitary. So those are two ki kind of, those are two tests that go hand in hand, thyroid stimulating hormone and free T4. That's correct. So one's a measuring what the pituitary gl gland is doing and the other one is what the T4 that the thyroid free is actually, free, free, free T4, T4 that yeah. the thyroid is actually That's producing. correct, yeah. Okay. And there's a bunch of other T's. It's very confusing. T, uh, FTI and uh, F, F, uh, free T4 and, and T4 and free T3 and T3 and T3 uptake. And so uh, so there's a bunch of different numbers, so don't get confused. But typically, most people only ever get the TSH. It's in the normal range. And, yeah. and if, the, if your doc or nurse practitioner feels your thyroid, there's no enlargement, no nodules, then they, that's enough. Uh, now, if, if you're super depressed or, or gaining weight for unknown reasons, they may do more than just the standard TSH. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's important to know. There are practitioners out there. There are uh, uh, integrative and uh, uh, integrative medicine doctors and functional medicine doctors that believe a lot of your problems are due to your thyroid, and they'll do a uh, big panel of thyroid stuff and things like that. And they, they for them they, they see they see things differently than what the typical endocrinologist who trained me sure. uh, sees and stuff like that. So they do see the world differently, and they treat you differently. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, that I think that about does it for this, some of these routine lab tests for blood. Um, we're going to talk about urinalysis with microscopy. So talk, yeah. talk to us about that. Oh, by the way, the TSH is be, uh, it's an old name. It's called thyrotropin. The thyroid stimulating hormone that comes from your anterior pituitary is called the thyrotropin uh, hormone. And so the so, but it's, it still starts with a T. Uh, anyway, it's, it's I know it's it's kind of uh, it, it gets confusing some of these terminologies. Yep. Um, all right, good. Uh, the urine urine analysis. Uh, so UA or urine analysis with microscopy. So you may see sometimes in the doctor's office, urine, we do a bunch of stuff with urine. We, d we You can get it at home for pregnancy tests. So that's not a urine analysis, but you can use urine for a pregnancy test. You can use urine to check for something, a special type of protein that we that may be in excess in, ba in poorly controlled diabetics, microalbumin. So you can check urine. So, But the urine analysis I'm talking about you can see that sometimes it's done in the doctor's office and sent off for the rest of it. Uh, but uh, UA is uh, is uh, in microscopy. They look under the microscope or they have a machine look under the microscope. Okay. Uh, but the UA has uh, appearance. If it's cloudy, if it's which is uh, or turbid, is you know uh, it looks uh, cloudy is turbid. Um, if it's uh, if it's um, uh, uh, if it's uh, if it's red or uh, brown, so blood or old blood. Uh, if it's uh, uh, um, uh, if if you've taken something that colors it, so sometimes it's very bright yellow because if it's B12, so there's uh, so they can describe. So there's some just eyeball description by the sure. by the technician, um, and then there's a pH, just like your blood has a pH, uh, uh, your urine has a pH, and that's highly variable according to what you eat and drink. Uh, so that's the next thing. Um, and uh, so uh, there's a big range for the pH uh, there from, from acidity to quite a bit of ba base so, or alkaline. So color, opacity, and, and, and Acidi acidity, ac acidity can, alkalinity, just, right. those characteristics tell you something about the waste products that are coming out. That's right. right? Okay. Yep, that's right. All right. And then, and then we have, um, if you have, you see intact red cells in the urine. So the red cells are not supposed to be in the urine at all. Uh, so intact red cells tell us that uh, depending, it could come from a bladder of cancer where it's leaking, you know, or it could come from uh, the kidneys. So r intact red cells, if they're uh, if they're uh, if broken up, uh, there so it'll be hemoglobin. So whenever you break up a red cell, the inside is called hemoglobin. So uh, uh, so it also tells you that the the red cell may have been ruptured because of the pH, or may rupture because it came through the kidneys mm -hmm. and it was was shredded on the way out. Mm -hmm. So it gives. gives so when you say red cell, like, like is this bl blood in the urine? Right. Or, like, so right. You, okay. So specifically. The red cells uh, that okay. carry oxygen, yeah. right? Oh, call to, talk uh, okay. about it. Mm -hmm. All right. So, it and it would be a, unusual for those things to make their its way into that's right. your urine. That's right. Okay. So, microscopic hematuria, uh, hematuria is blood in the pee, uh, and hemoglobin area is uh, broken up blood cells in the pee. Uh, these are red blood cells. Yeah. Mm. So, those tell us something, and those the, are that they may not be that's not normal. accurately filtered out by the kidneys or processed wherever 
where they're right, else that they're supposed to be. Okay. That's right. So uh, if you have microscopic uh, hematuria or uh, uh, blood in, in your pee, even if it's not visible, it's microscopic. It's, it's microscopic. You can't see it with your naked eye. So they see red cells. Uh, then that's, that tells us that we have to go investigating. Oftentimes, you have to look for stones or tumors if you have red cells in your mm. urine, Yeah, okay. even if you don't see it. That's an important, just like a lot of blood tests, we don't want to wait until you have symptoms of a kidney right. cancer or bladder cancer. Right. So that's one of the things we, that's probably 100%, uh, no, probably, so probably 80% of the bladder cancers, uh, 80 or 90% of the bladder, oh, probably 100% of the bladder cancers, and a couple of, and uh, probably 80% of the kidney cancers we found through microscopic hematuria. Okay. Yeah, that so, you've so caught? Yeah, come yeah, through yeah that. that's okay. right. Yeah, yeah. We found out, and we sent them to a urologist and who, who, who looked up the bladder and looked up the kidneys and found it, uh, the cancers. Uh, so... Intact red cells, ruptured red cells, uh, then white cells. So white cells, uh, leukocytes or white cells, uh, that tells us potentially it's infection or inflammation somewhere in the tr in tract. The, the upper mm -hmm. tract is the kidneys, the lower tract is the bladder and the urethra. Um, so, uh, so that's, and then sub to, within the white cells, we can have nitrites and, and leukocyte esterase. So nitrites are, are released by, uh, white cells that are fighting infection. So nitrites are kind of pretty specific that there's an infection going on and leukocyte esterase may or may not be positive if there's an infection, but right. it also comes from white cells being there. Uh, so, uh, and then, um, then glucose. Uh, glucose is if you have sugar in your urine, tells us that it's not normal. Uh, so it tells us that uh, potentially there's a bunch of reasons, but potentially that you may have be spilling your high sugars in the bloodstream. Your body can't handle it, can't get rid of it. Tries to get rid of it in the toilet, and mm. so it puts it in your urine. And so some people have lots of urination because as your sugar leaves your body, it pulls water out through your mm. pee. So you pee a lot of sugar out, right. but you're also peeing a lot of water out. Which is the way that um, some childhood diabetes That's right. is identified, That's exactly. right? exactly. So di okay. DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. Mm -hmm. These kids are losing weight. These are kids that don't know that they have diabetes, ty type mm -hmm. 1. They don't know that they're deficient in insulin. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, All of a sudden, what, they'll think they'll they have lose a, weight. A, a, yeah. or think they have a, a, ur a, a urinary tract infection or right. be wetting the bed when they don't usually do That's that right. kind of thing. They can yeah. be getting up at night to pee and stuff mm -hmm. like that. They're losing weight because they can't hold on to the calories. They don't have insulin to help them hold on to the calories mm -hmm. in their in body. And they're, because the calories are leaving their body in terms of sugar in their urine, it drags out water. These kids become dehydrated. So they end up in the ICU, in the ER, in the ICU oh, yeah. to start insulin and get hydrated again. Yeah, that's right. And then, uh, and then we have bilirubin uh, uh, in your urine. This is a liver product. So once again, if your liver is sick, it, it you have excess bilirubin in your bloodstream. It, your body can't handle it. It spills it out. Just get rid of it out from your body. Uh, uh, your uh, depending on why it's there, it can show up on in your urine. So sometimes your urine can tell us something about your kidneys, uh, something uh, uh, about your bladder. And so bilirubin, about your liver. did we? Where did we see that in our in the complete blood count? That's right. Panel? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, it is there a comparison made there between like how much is found in the CBC and what is found in the UA? That's a good point. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, certainly, whenever we see people are jaundiced, they're about uh, the bilirubin total bilirubin in the blood is about three and a half. So at least, and it could go much much higher than that. We see in babies who called you know mm -hmm. they get, they put newborn babies who are jaundiced under billy lights yep. uh, because they can break the the light. Certain types of lights can break down the bilirubin in their in, in their body and skin. But but yeah, it would be spilling out into their urine. And in fact, uh, yeah, in certain cases you could have bilirubin coming out in your urine, but you don't have bilirubin in, in your, your stool in your oh, in your okay. stool. So your your stool becomes what they call acolic or without color. So your stool actually can look in certain obstructions. You you uh, we'll talk about adults instead of babies if you if you if you're if if you're blocking your if you're blocking, uh, you can't get rid of your bilirubin in your intestines, right, with the food. It backs up from your gallbladder that's blocked off into your bloodstream. So your bloodstream is high. Um, so it's not, you, you don't get bilirubin that colors your stool brown. Huh. So your stool turns white. white. Literally looks wow. white. And then your urine turns uh, what we call Coca-Cola colored or tea colored. Oof. So your your urine turns, looks like bra 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 brown. brown um, and your stool turns white. And so wow. that's in certain obstruction uh, cases. And that's... Uh, that's uh, pretty much an emergency because some you're, you block you're blocking your your ability to get rid of bilirubin appropriately in their sure. appropriate cycle. Yeah. Okay, so is that everything on the your analysis? I think that'll that'll, that'll cover enough uh, to get people started. <laughs> okay, awesome. Okay, so that that was a, a lot of technical information, and obviously people aren't going to internalize all no. of this. The main the main points is um, you know that these are routine lab tests that are done. 
doctors are looking at um, it. Well, the important thing to note is that a doctor is interpreting these results, right? Yeah. Someone who is as fluent in all of the different components as Dr. Tadro says is looking at it. And they know you. And they know you That's to, help, to help you determine if there's something to be concerned about here. Um, you can't just rely on the, you know, the normal ranges that show up in your my chart when you get the results That's from, right. you know, it's pot and with, you know, healthcare transparency laws now, it's definitely possible that you're getting lab results in, in real time with your doctors getting them too. And yeah, so that they don't yeah. have a chance to interpret it or That's right. That's inform a, you about I'm, it first. I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. I'm sure there's some policies. Everybody makes their own policy on how to release Test results, whether it's mammograms or stress tests and stuff, or pathology from biopsies, but some, oftentimes with blood work and a lot of these things now, uh, X-rays and everything. Sometimes you're seeing it before the nurse practitioner, nurse doctor is yeah. seeing it. Uh, so a lot of people are freaked out, calling me urgently and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, and you always check what your policy of, of how they release it because it is up to the yeah. doctor's office or the the the, the, the empl who employs your doctor, the doc the medical group that has a set policy on how to release data. And stuff like that. Always know what should be coming back, because like you've heard me say before, some things don't come back right away. Uh, they come back as partials sometimes. Sometimes they won't release everything until everything's back. Sometimes they send you partials, so you may have to look two or three or four or ten times, waiting for each piece to come back uh, for whether it's this or other tests that we haven't talked about. Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, again, we want to. We always want to leave it with practicals and like what this information is supposed to help empower our listeners to be able to, you know, take control of in their own healthcare stuff. So a couple of questions related to that then. Um, should I ever request a blood test if my doctor doesn't suggest one? You always ask. I mean, I have no problems. People say, I've had patients say, hey, I, I want blah, blah, blah done. I said, well, we did it last time. Well, I, I feel better if I see it. And a lot of times it's not necessary, but some people feel com more comforted because they've seen other things in, the, uh, in other relatives or friends that where they where they was they caught something. So part of it is to figure out why the doctor's ordering or not ordering something. Sure. Some things, are, like you said, are not recommended. For PSAs are not recommended to be routinely done or once you hit a certain age anymore. Uh, that's why you have to talk to your doc about your risk factors, et cetera. Um, uh, so you please ask. I always I, This is what frustrates me the most is that I want patients to have an idea about their body and what their tests are and what they're interested in as they go in. So it could be an intelligent yeah. conversation. It's about if you're on the receiving end of, 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 a, of a hose, of right, a, a fire, fire hose of fire, information. A fire face, hydrant yeah. of information that <laughs> yeah. you, you don't understand, you don't know about, you right. don't understand. And but you're the one who has to pay for it. You're the one who has to go to the test, whether it's sure. blood test or whatever. Sure. And you don't know what it means, and it doesn't necessarily answer all the, uh, the the problems that you were worried about. So people either have symptoms, signs or symptoms of something, or they're worried if they're going to have signs or symptoms. Yeah. I may get a heart attack like my mother did at age, for, you know, forty eight. Right. So they they so uh, so I want people to uh, the interpretation and it's the interpretation of any test, uh, doesn't matter blood or anything, is is, is, is vital. And it, and it needs to uh, come in context of who you are, mm -hmm. right? So it's uh, so it's a big, big difference. Yeah, big difference. Yeah, absolutely. You touched on something really important there that we covered in our um, in our low back pain discussion. We were kind of discussing, you know, how, how to get a, 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 a symptom treated mm -hmm. um, to, to figure out what's going on. And and that is, you know, the importance of managing your expectations going into right. a uh, any kind of appointment. And a, a big way that you can do that is to come in with an intention, um, an intention that makes sense for the appointment. So right. just like you said, I either want to prevent something from happening or I want to know if something is happening. Right. Um, and then some of these tests might be might be ordered to help to flesh some of that stuff out. That's right. Uh, and, this is a, there's there are, there are reams and reams of other tests that can be ordered for all sorts of conditions, all sorts of signs and symptoms. This is a typical stuff that if you don't have many signs or symptoms, this is kind of quote unquote routine as part of a physical for a typical middle uh, middle age to older adult that that these may be something along these lines that you that you may be getting and stuff like that. If you have something more specific, uh, then there's 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 textbooks worth of of, of other stuff to be ordered and uh, in terms of just blood and urine and uh, other. Body, right. body fluids. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so one, one more question I think that's going to be relevant to people listening. Um, are my lab results relevant to all of my doctors? Should I keep right. my own copies of lab results to share with different providers? Yes. Uh, I, you know, a lot of stuff is available online, but but uh, but um, sometimes you want to get something from 15 years ago and they've decided that they don't have to hold it. Uh, for, for legal purposes, they don't have to hold uh, everything. It takes up space. Fortunately, space, electronic space is very cheap. 
Uh, but uh, sometimes if you've changed doctors and you change electronic medical record systems and you go back and say from five years ago, the doctor says, you know, well, you know, they'll, they'll have records, but they may not have everything that you want the way that you want it. So I would or ask people to either keep an electronic version of it or print it out and keep it in like you do the old days in files. Um, not every practitioner or uh, wants to see your numbers. Uh, they just want to know if something was done or somebody's taking care of it. Mm -hmm. They don't have to do it themselves. Um, so not everybody is as interested as I am. I'm, yeah. I'm kind of a geek about, I'm a, I'm a 10 tube Tadros. Yeah. Somebody, <laughs> somebody had a little, we, we couldn't issue. tell at all that you were interested yeah. in the subject. Yeah. I, they, <laughs> uh, yeah. But uh, you know, I, I was, a. Uh, uh, but anyway, and, and we're going to, to that. It's going to be much more, much more accessible, much less expensive mm -hmm. when people can get their, 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 their lactic acid levels and all the sorts of stuff, um, their post, uh, postprandial sugars after the meal sugars and uh, how, how their blood pressure does overnight. And we, we already have, you know, a good chunk of this data and we're going to get a lot, lot, lot more. Yeah. Uh, it's very exciting, a very exciting time. Um, uh, big, lots of data, lots of data to crunch. Um, and uh, help, and you'll have a artificial intelligence uh, and other people to help you interpret it and adjust your lifestyle. Sometimes by the minute, by the hour, by the day, as opposed to waiting, you know, three or four months or a year to see a doc to adjust something. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Very cool stuff. All right. So thank you so much for going over all this with yeah. us today, Dr. Tadros. I mean, just kind of a, a quick recap. Um, these are common lab tests that your doctor might order as part of routine, you know, just routine uh, physical. Um, they're normal lab tests to order. Um, blood is important because it communicates so much information about how the body is functioning. Mm -hmm. Everything from how you're processing nutrients to where your hormones are going, oxygen levels, um, you know, if your body is fighting infection, all of those things are communicated through the blood. Um, and then uh, lots of different things can affect your your blood, what's in your blood, nutrition, infections, age, the function of your other organs, there are lots of different things that affect it. That's right. um, and routine lab testing can be a really important part of, you know, just preventative screenings That's right. um, for all adults, basically. Very so um, having a general working knowledge of how some of this stuff uh, it, it, it is important. It's important to hear it. It's important to know. There are lots of great resources online. Of course, the yeah. Mayo Clinic has, you shared that with us. Mm -hmm. Um, all the information you could possibly want to know about the specifics of how these tests work and what they're checking for, mm -hmm, um, right. all of which gets covered in medical school and in residency and doctors get trained on. So, uh, the most important part of getting these, these screenings and tests done is having someone that can interpret it, that knows you mm -hmm. and can interpret it in right. a context that makes sense for you. Yeah. So I know people uh, crowdsource everything, you know, you know, these are my numbers or my doctor said this yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. So it's interesting. Well, well, it's a it's crazy, exciting times. A lot of stuff is, um, you know, the hierarchy, uh, hierarchy hierarchy of, of the doc being at the top of the pinnacle of the mountain, drizzling out orders and drizzling out, uh, you know, uh, results and drizzling yeah. out is, is kind of has been gone for quite a while. And right. so a lot of uh, a flattening great, of the organization. There's very, very, it. very flat, yeah. very flat. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, once again, everybody, thank you so much for joining us on the Not Your Doc podcast. Uh, if you'd like to send in questions or get involved in the pod at all, you can always send us an email at notyourdocpod at gmail.com. You can also check us out on our website at notyourdoc.com. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to have Dr. Tadros's blog along with all of our um, all of our podcast episodes. We've got a lot more to come for you this spring. Thanks for hanging out with us today. And Fun we'll times. be back. Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you, Seth. Seth Gabriel, our, our producer. Mm -hmm. Yeehaw. This previous podcast represents my opinions and the opinions of my guests. This is not medical advice, and I'm not establishing a physician-patient relationship with any listener. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for informational purposes only, and because each patient is so unique, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions that you may have.